You're tuned to WEOS Geneva, WXXE, Fenner, Syracuse. The talk we're about to hear by Dr. Michael Parenti is titled Rambo and the Swarthy Hordes. Michael Parenti is an author and political analyst. Among his books are The Sword and the Dollar, Inventing Reality, History is Mystery, and his latest, The Terrorism Trap. This talk was given in 1989 in North Hollywood, California, during the administration of George Bush I, an administration consisting of most of the same players that occupy positions in the present Bush administration. In the talk, Parenti looks at the entertainment media as a propaganda vehicle for American ruling class interests and attitudes. With the recent spate of war movies and TV shows glorifying the CIA, FBI, and police, this 13-year-old talk is eerily relevant. Control of media is even more concentrated now than 13 years ago, as most major media outlets are subsidiaries of massive corporations with interests in a variety of areas, including armaments. At the time this talk was given, Saddam Hussein was a great friend of the United States, and Osama bin Laden was, in the words of the great communicator Ronald Reagan, the moral equivalent of America's founding fathers. I want to today give attention to the other side of the media, not the news media, but the entertainment media, because the entertainment media consumes a much larger share of the viewing time of most Americans than do the news programs. And I thought I would call this book something like the hidden, hidden political images of the entertainment media. And then as I thought about it, I said, well, what's so hidden about it? It's rather blatant. And what I looked at are Hollywood films, that's what I'm studying, Hollywood films and TV dramas, TV miniseries, teleplays, and, and the like. What I find is a real abundance of images and ideologies, ones that are essentially supportive of imperialism, anti-communism, capitalism, racism, sexism, militarism, say militarism twice, militarism, authoritarian violence, vigilanteism, and anti-working class attitudes. More specifically, I found these kinds of themes. Individual heroics predominate over collective action. There's almost no collective action. There's almost no story or drama where the people organize together and do something for themselves. I mean, there are one or two exceptions. When they do, when there is collective action, they're usually led by some hero who has to spur them on and, and really do the whole thing himself. Free enterprise is the best economic system in the world. That's a message which is not necessarily telegraphed so much as it is presumed. Certainly, there's nothing positive ever uttered about alternative systems in the entertainment media. Private monetary gain is a central and worthy objective of life, although those who are too wickedly greedy, the dynasty guys and Dallas fellows, they can meet with disapproval. Sometimes business characters are insensitive to other people's needs because they're so busy with their business activities, but when properly apprised of the problems and such, they are suddenly capable of legendary, legendary acts of generosity which I've never seen in real life, but I see on television dramas say, the kid needs the house, give it to him. They give him to give it to, I'll give the factory to Joe. He's a good guy and all that sort of thing. Workers are beer guzzling, regular Joes. I mean, good natured and all that, but really not very bright. Incapable, if I was to say any one consistent stereotype I've seen about how blue collar people are portrayed in the media, with the exception of certain films. By the way, everything I say, there are a few notable exceptions. With the exception of a film like Silkwood or A Matter of Sex, a few others, they're almost always incapable of leadership and of acting as agents of their own lives. One wonders really where labor unions came from. Labor unions are always up to not much good. They're rather insensitive to the needs of workers. Some years back, there was a TV program, Archie Bunker, All in the Family, which was supposedly against various forms of bigotry. And while it came out against the bigot, who was Archie Bunker, and made a little message statement against bigotry, every program practiced a bigotry of its own by portraying the working person as this goof and goon, and one of the big laugh lines in All in the Family was when Archie Bunker mispronounced a word. 
committed a malapropism, and the canned laughter would come on. That's not funny. There's nothing funny when somebody mispronounces a word. I mean, all you're saying is that he hasn't had the opportunity to have the education that some other people have had. But class bigotry is a very common form of bigotry, and it remains totally unchallenged, unlike gender bigotry or race bigotry, which at least is challenged today. The practices and forms of class bigotry go on in abundance in the media and remain unchallenged. Affluent professionals in almost all programs are considered much more interesting than blue-collar or ordinary service workers. There are many more of them as principal characters. Women and ethnic minorities are really not as capable, effective, or interesting as white males. Cop shows, the police and everyone else should be given a freer hand in combating the large criminal element in America using generous applications of force and violence without too much attention to constitutional rights. In fact, in any number of cop shows, the cop will get up and talk about that constitution isn't going to protect you, it's only me with my gun and the hell with the constitution. The ills of society are caused by individual malfactors and not by anything in the socioeconomic system. No, no, no. There are some unworthy persons in our established institutions, but they are eventually dealt with and set straight for the most part. U.S. military force is directed only toward laudable goals, or more often the goals are not even stated. It's just assumed that we've got to win this one. Nothing said about what kind of interests are involved. I mean, after all, why are people doing all this fighting and killing? It's a question that remains largely unstated. Western industrial and military might, especially the U.S.'s, has been a civilizing force for the benefit of backward peoples throughout the Third World. The United States and the entire Western world have long been threatened from abroad by foreign aggressors, such as the Russians, communist terrorists, Arab terrorists, and generally the swarthy hordes of less developed peoples. Those are, I would say, some of the general themes that come up again and again in any number of uh, movies. And the last one is the one I want to focus on today. It's the paradigm of the wagon train versus the swarthy hordes. First enunciated very well by in a marvelous article by Tom Engelhardt in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. It could be happening in the American Wild West, it could be in the Amazon jungle, the North African desert, the Sudan, the Transvaal, the South Pacific jungles, or Indochina. The scene is generally the same. There's a fort or an encampment or a wagon train. And inside that encampment are the human beings. They're white. They're human. They're warm, they're attractive, they talk, and they're nice. Outside come the swarthy hordes, the savages. They can be Indians, they could be Bushmen, they can be Arabs on camels and horses or whatever else. And they are the subhumans and they are attacking the human beings. And the wagons form their circle and the human beings know what to do. They level their guns and they begin to knock off, shoot and kill these screaming savages who attack them. Why do the swarthy hordes attack the white people? <clears throat> You don't know. They never tell you. Is it to protect their lands? Is it to protect their herds? Is it to protect their villages and their towns and their families and their children? No, it's just because they like to do that. That's their thing. They like to attack. And so they have to be killed. And by the way, it's not even bravery that they manifest as they charge in great numbers and get cut down in horrible numbers. This is not even bravery, although similar acts by whites would be portrayed as heroic. This itself is portrayed as a manifestation of the swarthy hordes, their fanatic, crazed way of wanting to bloodlust. Now, the trouble with this paradigm, the trouble with this paradigm is that it turns the history of the last 400 years on its head that it reverses the roles of usurper and usurped. It reverses the roles of victim and victimizer. It reverses the roles of those who were massacred and those who were doing the massacring. It was the European and North American civilizers, so-called, who went in there and destroyed the villages and destroyed their industries and destroyed their townships. 
Read Engels on North Africa, what happened to the Arabs and Berbers. And when he goes in and describes the beautiful towns with the fine, hard stone and plaster buildings and their woolen industries and their mining industries and their arts and crafts and all that. And then read the description of the French troops coming in and systematically destroying it and killing every man, woman, and child. Read about how the Germans went into South Africa and killed the Heraro tribe. 80,000 people, they killed 60,000 of them. And the other 20,000 they used as slave labor in their minds. Read Mark Twain's angry, raging comments about King Leopold of Belgium, calling him a mad dog and what he did to the innocent, unoffending people of the Congo, taking them and enslaving them, a million of them a year, dying in the mines in the Congo. That's what the history's about. That's what John Wayne is about. And what these films do is they reverse that history, stand it on its head. They do what Joseph Goebbels said. They give you a big lie, and they embellish it, and they make you root for the guys in the wagon train. <laughs> Now, once, once you kill and once you plunder like that, once you go in to take another people's land and steal their labor and enslave their labor and take their resources and preempt and take over their markets, once you do that kind of act, and it wasn't we, it wasn't the ordinary people of Europe and North America that did it, it was the ruling interest that did it and they used our taxes, our money and our sons to go fight but once you do that, you have to do two other things ideologically and psychologically. One, you have to deny the humanity of your victims. They are subhumans and they are moral inferiors. As John Wayne said in one of his horse operas in 1953, he said, there's humans and then there's Comanches. A very clear message. He couldn't have said it better. There's humans and then there's Comanches. You're not killing human beings. You're killing these wild animals. By the way, you get the same quotes from Winston Churchill about the Afghanis. You can get the same quotes from George Washington about American Indians. And you can get them from any number of imperialists. The second thing you do is you must ascribe all your crimes to them. You deny your own inhumanity and you accuse your victims of doing to you what you have been doing to them all along. Sometimes imperialism can take on an endearing, tender note, though. I found one movie which I want to share with you. It was with little, cutesy, adorable Shirley Temple. She was in the movie called, ready for this, Wee Willie Winky, 1937. And she asked her grandfather, who's the British colonel, they're off their way out in some place where the British have no business being. And she says, why are you mad at Koda Khan, leader of the, quote, warlike tribes? The British colonel answers tenderly, oh, darling, we're not mad at Koda Khan. England wants to be friends with all her peoples. But if we don't shoot him, he'll shoot us. <laughs> This is sort of the Pat Buchanan, Cap Weinberger approach to foreign policy. <laughs> now, another interesting thing, these defamatory stereotypes and images demonstrate the unholy marriage between imperialism and racism. Marx has a very fascinating quote, I've got it in The Sword and the Dollar, uh, of British officers in the Sepoy Rebellion in India. It was a contemporary account. The officers said, uh, we hanged every nigger we found. In India, they're talking about India. Use the term nigger. We hanged every nigger we found. In every Indian they came across, they hanged them. The suppression was horrible. In South Africa, the people are called kafirs. In the Middle East, ragheads. In Asia, slopes and gooks. Well, these terms, nigger, kafir, slopes, gooks, this is a vocabulary of imperialism as well as a vocabulary of racism. And indeed, I'm not going to argue that imperialism is the cause of racism, but certainly imperialism is one of the biggest instigators and propagators of it. You have to finally define whole categories of people as different and inferior to justify what you're doing. Even when the imperialism is not of the violent sort, and even when the racism is not evident, it still can permeate a film sort of implicitly. Take the case of how Hollywood has dealt with Africa. The Tarzan movies, I won't even say a word, there it's so evident and so obvious, we'll just say the Tarzan movies. Okay, I've proven my case. <laughs> <clears throat> 
But let's go on. Let's go on beyond Tarzan and let's take a more modern day effort. Finally, finally, Hollywood, finally, in the 1980s, in the last 30 years, I've been waiting for an intelligent movie about Africa. There's a thousand stories in Africa. There are stories of tribal conflicts, of generational conflicts, of urbanization, of cultural change, of labor struggle, horrendous, incredible level of labor struggle like nothing you see in North America, like nothing you see in Europe. 250,000 gold miners out on strike together and they don't have computers and carpools and all that sort of thing. Incredible amount of discipline and organization and courage from a people who supposedly are not ready for self-government. A thousand stories, a thousand dramas that you can make. And so Hollywood finally makes a movie about Africa, and it's called Out of Africa. And what's it about? It's about an upper crust Danish literati whose major concern, it seems, is to hang on to her plantation and get it together with her beautiful blonde boyfriend, Robert Redford. That's what the story was about, played by Meryl Streep. And the Africans in Out of Africa, I kept looking for the Africans. And there they were sort of around the edges saying things like, is Sahib happy? Does Sahib want dinner now? May I do this for Sahib? Addressing her reverently. And then Robert Redford comes along and he sets her straight because he's kind of gone native a little, you know, and he says, I want to show you my Africa, the real Africa. I said, hey, here it comes, the breakthrough. And what does he do? He takes her up in the plane, and you see those same old aerial shots straight out of the Tarzan flicks of the zebra herds and the giraffes running along. Still no Africans. And I said, ah, oh, this is why they named it Out of Africa, because there's nothing in Africa <laughs> about it. <laughs> then finally we got to a really good film, and I do mean it, Gandhi, which at least portrayed Indian principles and showed the Indians acting with courage together, although it all came from the magic leadership of Mohandas Gandhi, apparently. And it even showed some of the brutality of the British. But even that film, I would have to make a serious criticism, because it gets to the heart of the political economy of the entertainment media. And that is that the political economy of imperialism was never shown in that otherwise fine film. The forced underdevelopment and impoverishment of India by British capitalism was never shown. The fact that when the British went into India between 1830 and 1900, the per capita earnings of the Indians dropped by two-thirds. That India was pillaged. That poverty was not an original condition of India. India is a lush, fertile subcontinent. The poverty of India is a direct cause of the policies of British imperialism, which was to forcibly deindustrialize India. That could have been dealt with in some way. You know, you could say, well, you know, I mean, what do you want, Parenti? How can you do that in a film? I mean, you can't start reading tracts of Lenin in the middle of a film or, or chapter three from The Sword and the Dollar. You know, you just can't do that. But during the course of a movie, you can have some discussion, some word explaining what are the British doing in India. I sat for three and a half hours through that film, and they never explain why are the British in India? What are they doing there? And you're left with the impression that they're in India simply because they like to strut about with their swagger sticks, and they simply don't have the decency to go home when asked to go home. <clears throat> But in fact, very powerful British interests got very rich off the land, the labor, the resources, and the markets of India. A film that really deals in an uncompromising way, and in a very good way, it's not a particularly well-made film, but the script and the political content of it is terrific, was made in 1969. It deals with imperialism, the political economy of imperialism, too, and that was called Burn, an Italian-French production. It's nice to hear applause from the seven people who are able to see that movie because the distribution, <laughs> the distribution of that movie was remarkable. I mean, it really dealt, it actually dealt with the class interest behind it, dealt with the transition from slavery to free labor. You had Marlon Brando explaining why it'd be better, it would have less costs and all that sort of thing. This movie was suppressed in its distribution. It was taken out of circulation. It did not reach many theaters and it did not stay long in the ones it did reach. And it would make a nice little story as to what happened to the distribution of that movie. 
There's another area where the wagon train paradigm exists, and that's right in the urban frontier. It's what Hal Himmelstein in his book on television calls the urban frontier. It's the fort, the wagon train, the encampment all over again, but it's in the middle of the city. Again, you've got the human beings, and they are under siege, and they are under siege again from swarthy hordes. There are plenty of TV shows, as you know, and plenty of movies. Let me just give you one, one called Cobra by Sylvester Stallone, who wrote it and acted in it. The comedian Jay Leno was right. Stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone deserve a lot of credit for opening up the acting profession to a lot of people who could not get into it back when speech was a requirement. <laughs> Cobra is, um, and by the way, this has been a standard character over the last 20 years, in the uh, last 15 years or so, in films and TV series. He's a whacked out Vietnam vet. Bitter, wounded, angry that he couldn't win it. He wanted to win it, and you didn't let him win it. So now he's a detective in New York, and he fights the whole gang. And they are trying to terrorize and take over the city, or the country, or the world. It's not clear. And so it's cowboy versus Indians, cowboy singular, cowboy versus Indians. And Cobra goes out there, and again, the same thing, makes his talks about you pussyfooting with the Constitution and all these rights, and I'm going to do it my way, and I'll really take care of them. And Cobra doesn't believe in sissy things like arrest, trial, and incarceration. He just executes these guys. He just murders people, and one of the gang guys he captures, he douses him with gasoline, and then he lights a match. As he sets fire to the guy, he sneeringly says, You have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Now, the most durable version of the swarthy hordes, that external alien menace that's going to come at us, is the red tide and the red menace. You can defeat the Indians and the Bushmen, but communism is still around there. And it will subvert us from within, or it will inundate us from without. You remember Ronald Reagan's speech about Nicaragua? If we don't stop them in Nicaragua, the red tide will be lapping at our borders. That Nicaragua is only 12 hours drive from Brownsville, Texas. That's if you drive 180 miles an hour, but <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> well, that basic paradigm, that image, is being propagated by our presidents, our political leaders. And in the 1980s, the Reaganite cinema reached new heights of anti-communism, and Soviet bashing reached new depths, I should say. Rambo II with Sylvester Stallone. In Rambo II, Stallone, he not only acts, if you want to call it that, acts in these roles, he also writes the scripts. And he turns around in that movie, and he says to his old Green Beret commander, he says, are we going to fight to win it this time? And he certainly does win it. He goes into Vietnam, and he kills a battalion of Russians. He kills the whole Vietnamese army. <laughs> they throw napalm at him. He's captured by them, he's tortured, and he liberates prisoners of war. He's aided by the fact that his adversaries all seem to be legally blind. They cannot shoot straight. Hundreds of rounds are shot at him, and they just always miss, <laughs> never, never fluff his hair. But while the movie is outrageous and it's ridiculous, again, don't lose sight of the fact that it's once more turning history on its head. I mean, in reality, the Vietnamese have exchanged prison of, prisoners of wars with the United States after signing the Paris Peace Agreement, which ended the war. And that whole POWMIA issue is really an outrageous pandering exploitation of the unrealistic hopes of those families conducted by the Pentagon and the U.S. government and played upon by people like Ronald Reagan. You know, there were 18,000 Americans missing in action from World War II. Where do you suppose they are? Are they being held captive in Toyota factories or in, <laughs> in beer cellars in Wiesbaden someplace or something? No, tragically, unfortunately, uh, sadly, they're dead, and it's acknowledged that they're dead. But the 2,000-some missing from Vietnam have never been acknowledged realistically for what they are, which is that they're dead. Instead, that issue is exploited. It's not only exploited, but whole movies are made out of it, not just Rambo 2, but Missing in Action 1, Missing in Action 2, Missing in Action 3, Bradford, Missing in Action 4, I think, is coming up soon. 
The second, U.S. prisoners of war were not tortured by the Soviets in Vietnam, as depicted in this film. They have Rambo being tortured by Russians. There is no historical record of that. There is, however, a record of South Vietnamese trained forces and U.S. special forces using all sorts of torture, electric shock, water treatment tortures on National Liberation Force fighters. Third, the Soviets did not drop napalm on anyone in Vietnam. You know who dropped the napalm in Vietnam. Just complete turning around. The U.S. dropped huge amounts of napalm and Agent Orange, something like 20% of the land. The whole food chain in Vietnam has been tainted. Vietnam was a country that had no liver cancer. It was an unknown disease because people ate sensible food like rice and grains and vegetables. And today it has one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world because of what we did to their ecology chain. That's not what you get in the film. I guess you can get that kind of lying from somebody like Sylvester Stallone. If he could portray himself as a fearless war hero, even though he spent the Vietnam era working at a private girls' school in Europe, why would we expect him to play straight with the larger history, right? Rambo III, Rambo is in Afghanistan now. And the Soviets are portrayed as sadists, rapists, and torturers who murder little children with explosive toys, a horror story that originated, uh, propagated by the CIA, for which there's no evidence. I don't, the Red Army has got better things to do than put toys down to blow up kids' fingers. For fun, good old Rambo sends a Soviet captive plummeting. He takes him, puts a noose around his neck, and he throws him off a cave shaft down to his death. And then for still more fun, Rambo dynamites him blows him up. He had him rigged up and he sets him off. What a guy, that Rambo. He gets along real swell with the Mujahideen killers, the feudal land owners, the Islamic fanatics, and the opium growers, the guys who took up guns when the Kabul government said that their women could take the veils off and their women could go to school and their children could go to school. They took up guns, laughably described as the Afghan freedom fighters. Those of you who supported them, I hope you continue to support and watch how they operate and what they stand for. Let me say that Rambo gets along real well with them. By the end of this third and worst of the Rambo films, our hero has sort of mellowed out a little. He gives his good luck charm to an adoring 12-year-old Afghan boy soldier who himself has shown killing Russians on several occasions. War is a kind of a healing, nurturing experience for Rambo. You know, in Rambo 1, which I didn't mention, he was a borderline psychotic. He got into all sorts of trouble. He was a Vietnam veteran who was just psyched and freaked out. By the end of Rambo 3, all this violence has kind of put him together. He's found himself. <laughs> As the movie ends, you feel he's going to move on, maybe head back to the States, buy a trailer, <laughs> hunt bear, settle down maybe, you know, get married, open up the nicest little gun shop in Texas. <laughs> Get married, I don't know about get married, because women don't figure in the Rambo movies. And in fact, most of these violence adventure movies, women just really literally don't figure, of course, as except for the bed scene or sex objects. They are uh, just attachments, uh, accessories to the heroes. I mean, literally attachments. They're usually attached, being yanked along by the hero as they're in heels and dress, as they're running from some danger. Uh, women have an uncanny ability to get themselves into dangerous situations for which they are extricated by their men. If they do handle the gun occasionally, it's ever so gingerly to just sort of shoot and keep their feminism. Usually they just stand there helplessly while the hero fights off a platoon of attackers. This is what women are for in Rambo movies. Movies like Red Dawn, Invasion USA, and television series like America, I think represent the crudest propaganda of the Reaganite cinema of the 1980s. They show the Soviets, assisted by the Nicaraguans and the Cubans and the Libyans, invading and attacking the United States and killing and massacring U.S. citizens. Again, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you know, history is stood on its head. The Soviets have never invaded the U.S. I have to kind of remind my students of that once in a while. But the U.S. has invaded the Soviet Russia, well, along with 14 other nations, 1919 to 1921. They moved in and took them over. But that isn't what you see in Red Dawn. In Red Dawn, the Soviets 
they have a nuclear attack on Washington, D.C. They wipe out Washington, D.C. because they are having troubles with their crop. They have crop failures and they're having famines, so they decide to take it out on Washington, D.C. And they come down and they invade and take over the heartland of America. And they're rounding up people and they're massacring them. Also in Red Dawn, Cuba and Nicaragua have emerged as leading powers in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and these Spanish-speaking soldiers are machine-gunning all these Americans. I mean, it's just horrible. But luckily, in a little town in Colorado, a group of high school students <laughs> escape. And they break into a sporting goods store, and they get out all these rifles, and they go up into the hills, spend the rest of the movie wiping out these uh, whole convoys of Russians. I mean, just wiping them out. I mean, you start feeling sorry for the Russians. They're just getting wiped out by these kids with the rifles who call themselves the Wolverines. In Invasion USA, that was even more fascinating. A secret expeditionary force lands in Miami. Can you imagine landing secretly in Miami on a bright moonlit night? Hundreds of Russians and Spanish-speaking, Spanish-looking guys, who we can assume are Cubans and Nikas, and, and Arab-looking fellas, who we can assume are PLOs and Libyans, maybe. And they're all actually quite a good little international force they had there. <laughs> and they, and they, uh, they land about 20 yards from the Montembleau, you know, uh, totally unimpeded, undetected. And I'm sitting there saying, who could do this fanning out, getting to trucks? They aren't drug smugglers. I mean, they couldn't uh, just... Uh, <laughs> get, and they fan out and they infiltrate up the coast and they start committing acts of terror which turn neighbor against neighbor and neighbors against the police and the police against the neighbors and nobody knows what's going on nobody can understand how this is happening nobody can understand what the danger is what it is they're confronting nobody except Chuck Norris who um <laughs> who rallies, single-handedly rallies some troops and wipes them out and saves America. Well, the Russians have never invaded the United States. I tell my students the United States has invaded Russia, and they say, what? What, what movie was that? What? <laughs> the Nicaraguans have never invaded the United States. While that film was being produced and made and distributed and viewed, the United States was invading Nicaragua for the ninth time in our history, seven of those times before there ever was a Soviet Union. The Cubans have never invaded the United States, but the United States has invaded Cuba in 1961 and has encircled Cuba and has oppressed that economy and done everything it could to destabilize that country with embargo, with uh, political oppositions, with acts of sabotage. The Libyans have never attacked the United States, but the U.S. has attacked and threatened and harassed Libya on several occasions. That's what the movies ought to be about. And Gaddafi's sin is not that he's a terrorist. Gaddafi's sin is that he took a country that had a social structure like Saudi Arabia, and in the Colonel's Rebellion of whatever year it was, 1965, thank you, what they did was they took over the land they reclaimed and confiscated the oil. They confiscated the property of the rich. They kicked them out. They instituted changes. They set up a reclamations program. They've planted 40 million trees in Libya. They've put in a public education program for every man, woman, and child. Women can now go to school. Women can even go to military academy. Gaddafi's real sin is that he's distributed income, that the Libyans have the highest per capita income and standard of living in the Arab world. And the Gaddafi's real sin is that he's an anti-imperialist. <laughs> and so what they do is make movies showing Gaddafi-like Arab terrorists terrorizing and victimizing you to stir up in us hatred and fear of these people. Well, you can say, well, you know, that's, um, that's the way it is with the masses. Luckily, uh, I'm not affected by that stuff. 
Well, Jeffrey Schrank did a very interesting study in one of his books. He pointed out that 90% of all TV viewers think that we are not affected by advertisements. He also pointed out that the same 90% buys roughly 90% of the products that are advertised <laughs> on television. And while we might think it is always other people being manipulated by these images and these sales appeals and these shows, the truth might be something else. Another investigator, Jerry Mander, in Mander's book, The Case Against TV, he argues that the media images are in a certain way irresistible in the sense that our brains absorb them regardless of how we may consciously regard such images. So you may consciously be watching this thing and saying, isn't this ridiculous, isn't this something? But these images are going into your head. They're going into the other side while this side of the brain is saying, isn't that awful? This side is absorbing it. Children, for instance, if you want to see how it works, look at children. You've got to carefully talk to a child and convince the kid that this isn't real life, that don't worry, that didn't happen. They really don't have an innate capacity to distinguish between real and unreal images. Only as they grow older, after repeated assurances from their elders, they begin to understand that the stories and the characters on the big screen or the little screen really don't exist in real life. In other words, their ability their ability to reject media images as unreal has to be learned. It's a learned ability. Their innate predisposition is to accept those images as real. Now, Manda argues further. He says the problem doesn't stop there. Even as adults, when we consciously know that a particular movie, TV is fictional, we still, quote, believe it to some extent. That is, we accumulate these impressions, and these impressions lead to beliefs about the real world. Our unconscious mind does not distinguish between the images we got from real experience and the images we got from a secondary environment like movies and TV. The mind doesn't work that way. Listen to what the African-American writer Ellen Holly has to say. I want to quote her at length because it's worth it. The way we are perceived by this society affects the most basic areas of our lives. When you apply for a job, the interviewer and personnel reacts to you not only in terms of who you are, but also in terms of who he thinks you are. There are countless images floating around in his head, and many of them are traceable to the media. You may sit in front of him as a neatly dressed, intelligent female who would do an efficient job, but if he's been fed one stereotype too many, he may look and see not you, but Flip Wilson's Geraldine goofing on the job, painting her fingernails, and calling up a boyfriend to chat on company time. If so, for all your qualifications, you're not the one who's going to get the job. Black teenage unemployment runs as high as 40% in some of the more deprived communities. I don't think it helps black teenagers get hired that the television box portrays them to the nation and to potential employers almost exclusively as vicious little hoods ready to rip off anything in sight or as goof-offs and clowns. Again and again I have seen black actors turned down for parts because they were told that they did not look the way a black person should or sound the way a black person should. What is this business of should? What kind of a box are we being put into? I have seen black writers told that the black characters they write about were not believable because they were too intelligent. Well, look, we're giving the people what they want, the argument goes. This is a popular culture. Let me make two arguments to that. One, the polls show otherwise. They show that, in fact, people are watching more television but enjoying it less. That substantially high percentages say they think it stinks. Most people at best say that TV is either not very interesting or mildly interesting. Only a small percentage think it's really terrific and they really find it great. It's called popular culture. In fact, most of it is done for sponsors, and most of these producers really go on the hunches they have, what they talk to their colleagues and their neighbors and all that sort of thing. And it's not popular culture. Popular is an adjective for the populace, meaning the people, something that comes from the people. This media culture doesn't come from the people. It's not a people's culture. If anything, the mass media have undermined, preempted popular culture. The folk arts are gone, folk crafts are in decline, community recreation, community forms of interaction. When people talk, often they talk about not their experiences, but about TV experiences and celebrity characters. 
The image environment is a highly fabricated, controlled one. It's dominated by multi-billion dollar multinational corporations. They are the ones who produce and fabricate and feed this culture to us. They not only have a preeminent influence over the quality of the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, but also now the forms of recreation that are available and even the very images we put in our heads. It's argued that demand creates supply. We're giving the people what they want. If they didn't demand this, they wouldn't get it. The people want it, so we give it to them. But quite often, as you know, it's supply that creates demand. People watch what's on television because that's the only thing that's on television. They go to junk movies because that's the, what the movies are. Rambo 3 opened up in 2,175 movie theaters in America. That's supply right there. That's giving you a whole hype that's going on for weeks before it opens up. That's getting people activated to get them to come see this movie, which, by the way, was a flop. It was a box office flop. Burn opened up about 40 movie theaters around the country and didn't last very long. So you could say people don't want to see Burn. They want to see Rambo. No, people aren't given a chance to see Burn. They might have found it very interesting. They might have found it very intriguing. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, is that capitalism is not only an economic order, it's a social and cultural order. It extends its influences into all of our life activities. You've heard about the movement to take back the night? Take back the night. Women talking about the right to walk safely on the streets at night. A very good movement. We also need a movement to take back our sight. We need to take back our culture, our institutions, the fruits of our labor, the intelligence and development of our children, the control of our own mental images, our own recreational and free time. We need to organize. We need to agitate against the garbage we're being fed. We need to support things like KPFK Pacifica and FAIR. We need to boycott these major media. We need to denounce them. We need to openly attack them and pressure them and organize against them. We've gotten rid of Step and Fetch It. We got rid of Amos and Andy. We got rid of Sambo. Let's get rid of Rambo now. These media are not totally immune to the political climate of opinion, and we can change that climate. The media do respond to some degree, even in only a limited way. George Bush introduced the empty metaphor of a thousand points of light. People are still trying to figure out what the hell he meant by that. So is George Bush. But there are, ladies and gentlemen, there are a thousand points of light. The very points of light that Bush is trying to douse. And that's the people, the people awakening. Bush said in his State of the Union message, he said people are still suffering from the Vietnam Syndrome. Well, the Vietnam Syndrome was people raising questions about the war. And then they began to raise questions about the leaders who produced this war. And then they began to raise questions about the system that produced the leaders. And so it is today. People are catching wise to imperialism, and one of the greatest bulwarks against direct U.S. intervention is the fact that U.S. public opinion prohibits it and will not go for it. The people are organizing and demanding a better deal at home and abroad. A thousand points of light have become 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, all over this world, all over the world you can think of, from Palestine to Central America, to Asia, to Africa, to Southern Africa, people are struggling. And right here in the U.S. itself, right in front of the Pentagon, people are struggling. The struggle for democracy goes on. Don't ever be discouraged. No Sylvester Stallone or Chuck Norris can turn that around, nor can their more fictitious counterparts, Ronald Reagan and George Bush, turn it around. <laughs> None of them will be able to stop the people's struggle to reclaim their own history, a history that is being made right now, every day, by us. Thank you very much. We have just 10 minutes for questions, so if you will come to the microphones, and we'll start over here. Thank you, Michael. You didn't mention the film Cry Freedom, which was universally attacked by the syndicated critics because it was not about Steve Biko. Was it uh, blackballed because it didn't go far enough or because it went too far? I had long discussions with people about Cry Freedom, and I came to the conclusion that, yeah, there was that racial bias. 
In fact, I mentioned it in the book I'm writing now, that there are blacks in South Africa getting tortured, and you just see that peripherally. The white family is put under house arrest, and you're in the house with them. Shown from the perspective of this white family, maybe you got to do that to reach white audiences and get them to see palpably how this kind of system oppresses black people and even those whites who might have a conscience about good and evil. That movie didn't get a mass distribution because movies of that kind simply will not get that kind of distribution. I tend to feel that the blue collars have a certain liking for this racist wagon train mentality that you've described, even though you apparently feel they do not. And also, they don't seem to object to the degrading, demeaning portrayal of themselves on TV as much as we would hope. Could you speak to those two questions briefly? Well, I think blue-collar people object to the demeaning and patronizing portrayal of themselves, if alerted to it. There was a study done by the International Association of Machinists, a content analysis of television systematically done, and it was done by machinists who were home at night and their families of how working-class people are portrayed in the media. It's a terrific study. It has been totally and completely ignored by the news media. When Wimpen Singer reported and held a press conference, it was non-news, showing how they're under-portrayed, how work is never shown, how the struggles of working-class people are never shown, how it's reduced to real uh, crappy stereotypes. So these people were aware, if given the opportunity to study this, the Teamsters Union even sent out a formal protest. United Auto Workers also sent out a formal protest against the Archie Bunker stereotype. Working people are not... Archie Bunkers, and we resent this. At least the labor unions have, uh, to some degree, done that. But you're right that often people are victimized if those are the images they get and they're taught to laugh on cue at this and all that sort of thing, that many people will accept it uncritically. That is true. I always have trouble with the paradox between whether it's really a degeneration of people's tastes or whether there really is some kind of pressure going on to keep the little gems that do get through. There are gems out there, like, for example, John Carpenter's They Live that came out last year, and um, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. And it's, it's amazing. You realize these people do have a tremendous audience. The Monty Python audience is tremendous. John Carpenter's audience, just for his horror films, is tremendous. And yet these gems come out by them, and they're, they're not seen. I can't figure it out. <laughs> but really, it, do you think, is it really a conspiracy that to suppress yes. the films? Yes, 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 God damn yes. it, yes. What do you think they're doing? What but, do you think these they, guys do? What do you think they get? Why do you think they're paid four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year to do? They're these, there to, they are the gate guarders. And when they get Bertolucci, have, who is the hottest ticket in international filmmaking to make a film, and he comes up with a film like 1900, which is a communist film, which shows these Italian workers singing the Internationale, facing up to the fascists, joining the party, fighting fascism, and they were the only ones who did, shows the big rich landowners collaborating with the fascists. You know what they did with that film? That film was slated for mass distribution. It had Burt Lancaster in it. It had all sorts of big Hollywood name people in it. Sterling Hayden and others. It was supposed to go into every shopping mall. When they saw what that film was about, bam, that was it. It went to about 10 art theaters in America. There were whole areas where you couldn't see it. When John Sales does a movie like Meituan, right. he couldn't get one studio, not one studio to support it. Because it was telling the truth about what the class nature of class struggle in this country is. It was telling the truth how they'll kill you. They'll kill you if you try to cut into their profits. They'll kill you if you try to have a decent wage for yourself and for your family. And he made that movie, how to do it independently. And I've been to parts of the country where people have never heard of May Tuan. I'm talking about people who are interested in political films. Just talking to Bob Caruso, University of Southern California, Northridge. He said, May Tuan, what are you talking about? What? No, it never showed around here. It never saw it. In Northridge, that was. The guy's a film buff. I've been to other parts of the country. It played strong in New York. It played for a while in Washington, D.C. It opened in Chicago, a couple other places. But there's a different kind of distribution. It's not the mass distribution. It doesn't go into hundreds and hundreds of theaters. So they do control distribution, but they don't control production that well. Capitalism will sell you a camera and a film and a computer. You can write these things and you can produce them. And all that. It's distribution. They control distribution. 
And yes, they consciously do not like certain things. Look at the Albanian travel posters they had up for Reds. I mean, just a week before it came out, there was this poster of this guy. I mean, it looked like an Albanian travel poster. I mean, Reds got almost no publicity. I mean, that was a remarkable film. By the way, that was a remarkable breakthrough because Beatty got an Academy Award for it. But again, they cooled that one. They cooled the distribution. I think there's a lot of examples, but you're absolutely right. I didn't go into that. There are a lot of good films, too, and I do talk about them in my book because it's important to talk about how do you do it right. What is your example of what would be a good film? I think the ones that are the best are those that come closest to historical truth. That becomes the criterion. Yeah. In the Things We Can Do department, a comment when Rambo was speaking, a group of veterans in San Francisco called the Veteran Speakers Alliance organized educational pickets by Vietnam veterans of the film Rambo. We did that around San Francisco. We sent action packets around the country. It was front page news. Caralco, who was promoting the film, called up to ask, what's your problem with it? They even suggested a debate with Sylvester Stallone, which they later, of course, changed their minds on having... <laughs> That would be fascinating. Stallone. That would be the greatest cultural <laughs> event of the year, a debate with Sylvester Stallone. How would you do it? How would you do that? <laughs> Go ahead. But within a month after these pickets appeared around the country, the film Rambo 2 was withdrawn from movie theaters and simply went into cable distribution. Uh, well, that's so good. And by, can I point out also the political action that went around the TV series America? That there were a lot of people who did a lot of good political work against that. Here was at a time when the hope was that there was going to be some kind of arms agreement or some kind of way of de-escalating this overheated Cold War, and people really explicitly fought that and fought it well. So I wanted to suggest that a lot of veterans now are going into high schools because if you go to a Rambo film, it's almost all adolescent teenage boys that are seeing it. And one thing that people can do is to find out if recruiters are in the high schools to you know, neutralize some of the BS that are given to them by recruiters and by the makers of Rambo films. Uh, could you go into deeper how they control distribution? and how they suppressed the distribution of the 1969 Italian... Uh, the movie the 1900? Movie, the Burn film. I don't know. That's a story I still would like someone to come up with. I haven't researched it. Or I can tell you my own personal experience with Burn. I was living in Burlington, Vermont, and it opened on Thursday. And the new film always comes in on a Thursday. It goes from Thursday to the following Wednesday. And it opened on Thursday. I said, burn. Oh, I want to see that. I really want to see that film. And I went on Friday, and it was gone. It was closed. The manager had pulled the film off. Now, that's from only one place. But I later heard in other places that it didn't run a week, or it never came. Or a poster would be up, it's coming, but then it never appeared. That was the more common thing, that it was supposed to come, but then it doesn't come. Some of the suppression is carried out by the media, by the gatekeeper critics. Conservative critics like Gary Arnold for years in the Washington Post reduced the cinema in Washington, D.C. to imbecile stuff. The guy was a conservative, really. Any film that had any feminist values in it, any anti-military values, any political content of any kind, he would just pan it, rip it apart. And he would always say, a plot unresolved, characters weak. Well, I mean, quality films, too, like Gaijin. You ever see that one, the Brazilian-Japanese film about the workers in Brazil? You didn't see it. Ah, oh, you didn't see it. It was a great film. This should have opened in 2,000 theaters. It was a story about Brazilian, Japanese, and Italian workers in Brazil in the early part of the century and how they'd been brought in immigrant workers and the struggles they went through and what happened there. He just ripped that apart. It lasted a few days. All my friends said, oh, that's a lousy film. I'm not going to go see it. I said, go see it, go see it. So quite often in your media, your back pages are more rigorously controlled even than your front pages. That was true of Time magazine. Henry Luce used to check out the back pages and make sure which books were going to get reviewed, which movies, how, what was going to be said about them. They know very well that that's popular, that that's reaching millions of people, and they want to be clear as to what images you get and don't get. And there are ideological controls as to who becomes a movie critic and who doesn't in the mainstream media. 
might make a nice addition of extra, or at least a, a story in extra, about who reviews these movies and why and how and what kind of things they like and don't like. Thank you very much. We've been listening to Rambo and the Swarthy Hordes, a talk by Dr. Michael Parenti given in 1989 during the first Bush presidency. 